All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about the conditional logistic model. Uh, if I get to the right screen. Yeah. Put, call these recurrence risks, put it in this form, uh, which is equal to e to the beta i, then for a single relative pair of type of type, uh, ex you can see this uh, for a single relative pair of type R, we have this like a ratio. And if allele sharing is known with certainty, then the model is conditional logistic. If not, the model is a mixture of conditional logistics weighted by the estimated allele frequency sharing probabilities, the F sub R i hats. The denominator sums over the set of pseudo controls that represent possible IBD outcomes multiplied by their prior probabilities. Okay, so now we have to talk about constraints on the model. This is another little difficulty with the model. Set beta zero equal to zero. And let us talk about the Holman's triangle, which maximizes, uh, let's, we got the now using the uh, notation Z1, Z2, and Z0. And Z1 greater than Z2 is the same as Z0, which is identical to two times e to the B to one greater than two. And B to one greater than equal to one or B to one greater than equal to zero. This is the, uh, uh, this is, these are restraints we put because of Holman's triangle. We'll see this in pictorially later on. We also say that Z2 plus Z0 must be greater than Z1, which is another way of saying e to the b to 2 plus 1 must be greater than e or equal to 2 times e to the b to 1. Or in other words, e to the b to 2 greater than twice e to the b to 1 minus 2 or put it another way, b to 2 is greater than or equal to the log of 2 e to the b to 1 minus 1. So the additive model, in the additive model, lambda 1 equals lambda 0 plus lambda, half of lambda 1 plus lambda 0 plus lambda 2, i.e. lambda 2 equals 2 lambda 1 minus 1. Put it back on the beta scale and you're saying beta 2 is the natural log of 2 e beta 1 minus 1. So this is the Whittemore and 2 min-max 1 parameter model for affected SIB pairs under the Z parameterization. What it does, it basically tries to get things down to one parameter rho. It's rho times the this first vector plus one minus rho on the assumption we uh, we have a mixture as it were a mixture of linked and unlinked now i don't know about you guys i had never heard of the term min max before i heard it from alice whittemore i always used to call it minimax i presume it's the same but anyway this is the way she does it and rho is a mixing parameter, whereas A is a mode of inheritance parameter. So rho is what you're going to estimate. A is what you're going to fix according to whether you want dominance or recessiveness. If you fix A at 0.275, about halfway between dominant A equal to half and recessive A equal to zero, we and we maximize over rho alone the model has mo more power for most genetic models than the two parameter model and so this is what the Whittemore and two paper suggest you should do i to go through this paper is i found terribly difficult but i was lucky in that i heard alice Whittemore present the paper once and she gave me the essential uh, points. So uh, reparameterized in terms of relationship relative risk, the Whittemore 2 minimax, minimax constraint is lambda 2 
equals that expression when a equals 0 0.275. More generally, we can let lambda 2 equal alpha plus 1 times lambda 1 minus alpha, where alpha is the mode of inheritance parameter and equals 2 minus 38 or divided by a. If mode of inheritance is dominant, we have a equals a half, alpha equals one. A equals a half is like the mean test, if you like. If mode of inheritance is recessive, a is zero, and this is more like the proportion test, and alpha goes to infinity. In LODPAL, the user can specify alpha a priori. And it's easy to specify zero, you can't specify infinity, but I remember Jane used to say 300 was a good number to put. So I presume if you put 300 and then 400, the difference is so trivially small, it doesn't matter. Supposing we're looking at affected SIP pairs, a rare disease, let ZI be the probability that affected SIP pair shares I alleles identical by descent. The mean test has as null hypothesis z2 plus a half z1 equals half. That's the most powerful additive inheritance. The proportion test says z2 equals a quarter. Uh, that's testing that null hypothesis as most powerful recessive inheritance. And if you do the math because the zi's all add up to one, Z2 plus a half C1 is a half is exactly the same as a half C1 plus C0 is a half. That's, you can see that straight away. Maybe not quite so obvious, but Z2 equal a quarter if and only Z1 plus Z0 is three quarters. Okay. So this is known as, as, the, as a triangle. And what we see here is a green line and the left triangle is if you if is linkage by the mean test and SIPPAL test mean test membership in the left triangle that's what it does it says are you to the left of the yellow of the green was it green or yellow that's a good question it's a yellow line on the other hand the Proportion of shearings taken two alleles identical by descent is the null hypothesis right there in the middle, sort of. Z2 is a quarter, and Z1 plus Z0 is, uh, Z is three quarters. And the proportion test gives linkage to the left of the line. And SIPPAL uh, uh, test, all, all the proportion tests in SIPPAL test membership of being left to the uh, purple line. So the compromise min-max test, we consider tests of the form Z2 plus A Z1, which is a quarter plus little a times a half. And we choose little a as 0.275. We get these uh, quantities that are less than or equal to half. Now, Let's look at this triangle. The mean tests in SIPPAL test membership to the left of the yellow line. The proportion test test membership to the left of the purple line. And the blue line is min-max, somewhere between the two. However, we go a little further now. We have to talk about the Holman's triangle. This paper came out a bit later. And he, in this paper, he pointed out that if we have Mendelian inheritance, we must also have Z0 greater than zero. Z1 must be greater than, Z1 must be greater than two Z0. And also both Z2 plus Z0 must be greater than Z1 and Z1 must be less than a half. And here we have it here. This is known as the Holman triangle. In left is the area where we must uh, restrain all our likelihood maximization to if we want to be sure we have Mendelian inheritance. Uh, 
I have this, I find this slide a bit difficult uh, only because it, it's two dimensional with Z1 and Z0 and you don't see Z2 except by difference. But anyway, and other people have maybe made better pictures, but this is the picture I have. And it, what it's saying is we are only going to maximize in that yellow triangle. So in this method uh, of logistic uh, regression, if you like, this logistic method, conditional logistic, you can put covariates in. And that's what Jane really liked. To allow for covariate X, it's only allowable in what's called the one parameter model. We take lambda X is equal to beta, e to the beta plus delta X and maximize over delta and beta. Okay. And we only maximize in that triangle. Assuming the default baseline models for affected SIP pairs, then the affected SIP pairs and discordant SIP pairs can be combined in a likelihood that contains only two unknown parameters by setting lambda 1 equals e to the beta plus delta y. Well, where delta is less than or equal to minus beta, and y is zero for affected zip pairs and one for discordant zip pairs. So now we have to consider constraints on the covariate coefficients because, you know, with that extra term in the in the logit, if you like, with with the coefficients there. Depending on what coefficients you have, you of course the coefficients, the 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 actual uh, you're going to include the covariate of the individual plus a regression coefficient, and so that term can go all over the place. But you have to have some restriction. There are two restrictions that are allowed in this program, Lot Pal, for standard. Affected SIP, SIP pair analysis, the parameter space is considered it's so that the recurrence risk ratios are greater than one, greater than or equal to one, and such that they correspond to single locus segregation. That's quite simple. But now, once you put in a covariate, it's not clear what constraints are most appropriate. You could say, if you want, well, there's two options. You could say the constraints hold for all values of the covariate. This is called the minimum constraints. This is perhaps a little extreme because for some individuals, they may have values of the covariate so far out that your constraints are not representative of the sample. So the other possibility is the constraints must hold at the mean value of the covariate, but not necessarily, necessarily at other values. For a symmetric covariate distribution, at least half of the distribution will give risk ratios compatible with the constraints, its mean constraints. Okay. Uh, if the covariate is centered, you don't have to do anything. Uh, you don't have to put any other constraints on delta. So those are the constraints. And I suppose uh, how you uh, choose you choose by looking at the distribution of the covariate, covariates in your sample. And I suppose if it's symmetric, you might want to just send, just use the, uh, the, the, the standard, okay. Or with the, uh, I don't know, or, or, or you, you're not minimum, but or if there's some outliers, it depends exactly what that distribution is, whether you use the, the uh, minimum or the mean constraint. So let's go back. Are there any questions about this whole methodology and uh, how it is implemented in SIPPAL? I don't hear any questions. Okay, everybody's either asleep or they understand it so well they don't want to know any more about it. All right, now we're going to come. Now we're going it's to come. Part. Yeah, the program is a lot of part, my SIP pal. Just want to make sure. So there's lots of problems where SIPPAL doesn't have so many problems. I, I think that's true. 
So now, now look at model-based linkage methods. These are the traditional old ones. All right. Before, this goes back a long time. I suppose the basic uh, first one was by Holden and Smith back in the, oh, I don't know, 30s or 40s. Okay, using maximum likelihood on pedigrees, at least of size, of, of three generations, maybe more. So the maximum lot score, which we shall denote, to note theta uh, z of theta hat in other words it's max use the maximum likelihood uh, estimate of theta it measures the amount of evidence for linkage and so this z of theta hat is just the log to base 10 of the likelihood evaluated at the maximum likelihood estimated theta hat divided by the likelihood at 0.5 now suppose you look at twice this z theta hat then it can be compared with uh, and you use logs to base e if you use logs base e you can compare it with a chi squared with one degree of freedom but we want a one-sided test and when you do that log to base 10 of the uh, the hat of a of a over log of uh, 0.5 greater than three corresponds to the this log to base e being greater than 13.8 and this because the uh, log to base 10 is greater than three we know or we can prove we can show whatever that the p-value must be less than 10 to the minus three but asymptotically, it's going to be 10 to the minus 4, and it's going to be uh, as long as you take a one-sided test. So well, that's because the twice the log to base e of x is twice the log e of 10 times twice the log 10 of, uh, of x. And if you take, th uh, let me see, 3 times uh, 4.6, that's 4.6. 3 times 4.6 is 13.8. So that's how that how we get that. Uh, the whole thing is confusing because uh, we, we, I mean, doing logs to base 10 is what uh, the logs that were defined by Morton because they were easy to understand. On the other hand, for the theory to work, you need logs to base E and to be able to get an asymptotic chi-squared distribution. All right. Now, suppose we want to test for homogeneity of the recombination fraction. There are, I suppose, three tests available. There's lots of tests available, but I'm thinking in log pal there. I think there are, in a log, uh, sorry, this is log link this program, this original uh, linkage analysis with LODs. Uh, suppose the pedigrees are grouped into K classes. Could we ask, could the recombination fractions be different in each class? Asymptotically, the number of informative meioses in each class large is what we mean by asymptotically here. Uh, so you've got to realize we mean in each class. So if there's a lot of uh, pedigrees and you're doing it among pedigrees, you've got to realize you're assuming each pedigree is getting large. Uh, and the number of informative meioses gets large. Then you get a chi-squared with k minus one or, or a chi-squared with two times k minus one degrees of freedom for twice the difference in log e likelihoods between maximizing the whole sample over theta and maximizing each class separately. Okay. And it's 2k if you are if you're if you're estimating two recombination fractions, that is different for the two sexes k minus one if there's just one and this goes back to morton 1956. so let's look at some tests for homogeneity recombination fraction we can ask 
for example, are the male and female recombination fractions different? Now, asymptotically, we'd get a chi-squared with one degree of freedom for twice the difference in log likelihoods when maximizing over common and spe sex-specific recombination fractions. That seems simple enough. But let us suppose now, let's look at a different way of looking at it. Suppose we have, we, we suppose that in a proportion alpha of the pedigrees, there is linkage. In other words, we suppose that the likelihood given alpha, the proportion of pedigrees in which there is linkage, and at theta, it's made up of a mixture. The mixture being a proportion alpha, there is linkage, and a proportion one minus alpha whoops, I can't get there, on portion one minus alpha, we say the, we're, talking, we're talking about no linkage. So the model is that alpha lies between zero and one and theta lies between zero and a half. No heterogeneity, alpha is equal to one. If alpha is equal to one, there's no heterogeneity. This just disappears. And twice the log, uh, the log ratio is a half point mass at zero and a half chi squared with one degree of freedom. And this was the uh, homogeneity test. This was the model suggested by C.A.B. Smith in 1963. So let's try again, test, uh, test the linkage allowing for locus heterogeneity. We're gonna use this same model. We're gonna assume there's a proportion alpha of the families with this recombination fraction, a portion one minus alpha that are freely, uh, free, uh, completely unlinked. So the model, the complete model is that alpha lies between somewhere between zero and one and theta lies somewhere between zero and a half. Now, when you look at this, no linkage, notice that if theta is a half, alpha is irrelevant. See, if theta is a half, uh, this is irrelevant, okay? Alpha here will be one, obviously, because we'll all be here. On the other hand, if alpha is zero, theta is irrelevant. If alpha equals zero, then you, if alpha equals zero, this is just one, it's likelihood at a half, okay? So, the p-value for testing the alternative theta is less than half, is half the p-value for testing the alternative theta not equal to half. And this was uh, shown by Faraway in 1993, a beautiful paper, I thought. If there is heterogeneity, log score should be reported from the Likert ratio that fixes alpha at its maximum like estimate because alpha could be expected to differ among populations. So that's what one should do. And this is a wonderful result from Faraway. So let's look at sex heterogeneity. This is a little, there's a little problem here. You can look at, you can estimate over male and female and divide it by the likelihood of half and half for the male and the female, chi squared with two degrees of freedom, but you lose power and it's difficult to make this one-sided. I'll have a picture in a minute, I think. So what we can do instead, instead, we can maximize this, but underneath we maximize this, where theta m and theta f are maximizing the likelihood subject to the condition that the sum of the two is equal to one. This gives a chi-squared one with increased power when phase is known, or the difference between the male and the female uh, recombination practice is larger. And it's easier to make this test because it's one-sided. You're just testing you're just testing one parameter. The problem is if you are testing two, and there's half, half in the middle, 
clearly, if you're in this quadrant, you have linkage. Okay, in this quadrant, we don't have linkage. Both halves are greater than one. What do you do in these two? It's not at all clear what one should do. So this paper by Cleverson also said, well, why don't we do this? And basically, you then have a one degree of freedom and you get to a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. So that's the idea there. It was, I thought it was a clever trick. Maybe I thought of it. I don't know. I won't swear to it. Okay, so now let's consider multipoint. For a trait with model T, we want to compute the multipoint log score of T at point P. Sorry, for a trait with a model, sorry. We want to compute the multipoint log score at point T, uh, point P between these two markers on the chromosome C. So basically this is what we do and we've seen it before. The LOD score of this trait at point P is given by this expression, which we've seen before. This L prime is a vector, N by one element vector. Li is an N by N diagonal matrix, these, these, L2, LJ, all these in the middle are diagonals. And LT is an n by n diagonal with elements equal to the elements of LT. And the Likert vector is based on model T. This, each of these T's is a transition prop matrix between locus I and I plus one. So here you've got one between I plus one and J and let me see. Well, here's you've got between one and two in general is between this. Here's between J and P and you go on until the last one is between the last two uh, markers. This here is the likelihood of the markers on the chromosome C. And LT is the sum of the elements in, the, uh, in these vectors. So now, okay, so that is that. I don't know if there's any questions about that, but that's what it boils down to. We've seen this kind of thing before. We're going along and using all the data at every marker to talk about what the likelihood of this trait is at a, with this model at a particular point P. All right, any questions before we go on to association analysis? We're going like a house on fire, I can see this. All right, association analysis. So this is interesting because this was an association analysis program, but it may have been used more for estimating heritability, I'm not sure. Uh, but it was designed for association analysis. In other words, you're looking at a lot of markers and forming association analysis. And one nice thing about it is you can do maximum likelihood for the, the correct model, though it will take a long time. But you have a way, you can do various tests. And if you're trying to do a few million tests, well, you may say, let's just do a thousand first, roughly. And then the top thousand you get roughly will then do properly. That's one thing you can do. And uh, that's probably the best thing to do because the pro once you do things properly, when I say properly, I mean real maximum likelihood and getting the right p-value and everything. That tends to be rather long-winded. Okay. Oh, sorry. I forgot. I thought we were going to I thought we were going to uh, ASOC. We're not. We're going to TDTX. So this is, remember, this is a TTT, but an exact kind of TDT analysis. So you, this is uh, relatively fast. And large, now you've got to remember that large sample tests do not follow large sample distribution well when the tables are sparse. But we get exact p-values computed by TTDTX. 
And the idea is conditional on, remember the, uh, the NIJ and NJI in a matrix, the, the numbers of parents of each heterozygote, MIMJ, we find all the possible sample outcomes. Let's look at it. For example, if these uh, had up to three, then the possible values are obviously 0, 3, 1, 2, 2, 1, 3, 0. Now, if uh, the uh, number is much bigger, then you're going to get a huge big matrix. But let's look at this. We compute the probability of each outcome, the whole table, some of those probabilities that are smaller than or equal to the probability of observed data, I include only those outcomes less likely than or as likely as the observed data. And that's how you get your p-value. So your p-value is the probability of the outcome that you observe less than or equal to, uh, this is for complete symmetry now, this is where we're testing this equal to this, we uh, summation, of all outcomes as or less likely than the observed. And this we actually do uh, possibly sampling, it depends. Now, if you have large samples, then you've got some uh, asymptotic results. The asymptotic results are as follows for complete symmetry. You have K minus K minus one over two tests you are performing, and that's the number of degrees of freedom. And so the T statistic for complete symmetry is just this, okay. And that is the uh, using the exact test. Marginal homogeneity, if you'll remember, that is usually more powerful because you're doing fewer tests. And the marginal of the chi-squared eventually is, is K minus one degree, uh, degrees of freedom. And this assumes basically it's a TGT kind of test. It assumes the margins are independent. This is the uh, marginal homogeneity test. We saw that, I think, on day one, maybe day two. I can't remember now. And the marginal homogeneity, you get a chi-squared with K minus one degrees of freedom. Uh, you know, is more powerful than this one, uh, the marginal homogeneity uh, for the, for when you're looking at all complete symmetry. That's basically, I believe, complete symmetry. This was shown by Bickabula and Claire Shadapu in 1995. And you can do the marginal homogeneity just by doing this and multiplying by this correction factor. So when there are too many possible outcomes, we take a sample of the possible outcomes from the permutation distribution. This option also allows us to estimate the exact p-value for, for the marginal homogeneity test as well, if you want to do it. For each simulated sample, we compute the marginal, uh, the statistic for marginal homogeneity, and the p-value is the proportion of the samples in which what we compute is less than uh, what we calculate for the observed data, because we're trying, or greater than, sorry, what we, what we, or equal to what we calculated from the observed data. Now we come, any questions on that before we go to ASOC? You recall the main point about the TDT is that it tests for linkage in the presence of uh, association or association in the presence of linkage. You have to have both parameters. The delta has to be greater than zero and the uh, linkage has to be the, the theta has to be less than a half, otherwise you don't get a signal. So that's the point of it. And my guess is it might still be useful. I don't know. I'll leave it to you. Any questions about it? All right. These are all the, the theory behind it, how we get the uh, exact p-values. 
or at least the estimated exact p-values, put it that way, based on a not the complete data, but a sample of the data, a random sample of tables. Now the ASOP model. So as I say, the ASOP model was designed purely for association for when we started getting markers that we thought were associated. This was even before, we were doing this even before we had the millions of markers. Maybe we only had, oh, uh, hundreds maybe. Okay. So let us, for individual J, we, we have some continuous trait, YJ, and XJ is a vector of covariance. These are fixed covariance. Each individual, you have a set of covariance. They're considered fixed in the, uh, in the uh, statistical sense. They're not random. And let GJ be an additive polygenic effect. This in the statistical sense is random. We do not observe it. And let FJ be a nuclear family effect, random, an effect that is common, common to all members of a nuclear family. And let MJ be a marital effect. It's also a random effect, something common to the two spouses. And let SJ be a sibship effect, a random effect. So if you only have sibships, uh, then the uh, nuclear family effect is confounded with sibships, okay? Uh, and let EJ be a residual effect, also, of course, assumed random. The covariates are fixed in that we assume we know the values of the, the covariate values for each individual. These others, none of them do we know, and we're going to estimate their variances. Then the model is of the following form. You say, you, I, you take a transformation, and that's equal to this uh, regression model, plus all these variance components, at least all these, uh, these individual residual things of which we're gonna estimate the variances, or if you want, you can take this H of Y minus this expected value with all these things. The model should give very similar results. The difference being that, as I mentioned before, if you do this asymptotically, you are going to get mean unbiased estimates. Whereas if you do this, you asymptotically, you're Wait a minute, this one is the, uh, these are median. This is the default because I think it's better, but you can do this, you can have whichever you want, but the default is to get the median unbiased estimates. I think they make more sense to, you know, to think of the medians. All right. The polygenic effect GJ and all the other random environmental effects, FJ, MJ, SJ, and EJ, assume to be normally distributed with mean zero and we're assumed to be mutually independent. Uh, tip, uh, in practice, if you have enough of these and if you can, do, you can actually make more classes to get intra-class correlations, if you make enough classes, you will hopefully get to a point where these are all independent. Uh, if there's something special about these that makes them correlated, then we need to get rid of those correlations, either by more parameters in the linear model or by adding different classes, making more classes, just not the family, the marital sibling and environmental. So FJ is a random effect that a person shares with his or her spouse and children. Okay. MJ is an effect that spouses share with each other. 
SJ is in effect the full sub share with each other. And EJ is a person specific random effect. And these random effects are assumed to have variances respectively, sigma squared G, sigma squared F, sigma squared N, and, and so on. Okay, and as I mentioned, I probably on day one or day two, you can define other classes if you want and put those in too. So the variant of HY is made up of the sum of all the variance components. Note that each of the random effects are specific to a particular constellation of relatives. So some relatives will have some, some will not have as many. So any of the variances other than the residual could be zero. And this is the point that we, uh, I suppose we decided, well, since we have it, why don't we estimate what everybody calls heritability? In other words, the variance of the polygenic effect divided by the total variance. So uh, after transformation, this is each environmental variance component divided by the total environment variance can be interpreted as an intra-class environmental correlation. So for nuclear families, you can say this is the intra-class correlation for the family effect. This is the one for the marital. They have these two components and siblings have these. Uh, that's, I mean, there are lots of assumptions behind this, but it's, there are less assumptions than those that most people make. P-values for the variance components are one-sided, all the others are two-sided. So let's consider estimating the parameters. In addition to estimating the variance components, we can also calculate the familiar correlations on the basis of this model. And you get the correl familiar correlations based from the variance components. For full SIBs, we look at the uh, full SIB, the, uh, the, sorry, this is the family effect. This is the, fa they have a family, effect. they're all in the same family. They have a SIB ship effect, they're all in the same SIB ship, and they have half the genetic, full SIBs have half the genetic. And you divide that by the total variance, and that gives you the full SIB uh, correlation under this model. Half sibs. Now you don't have the full sib effect, but you do have a quarter of this. Okay. Parent offspring, we have the uh, family effect. These all have the family effect in them, and this one is half the the, uh, the genetic full sibs. They also have the sibship effect. So sometimes you may want to make this family effect zero because there's too much of all this, but this allows for all these things. And if this turned out to be small under this model, because everything else allows for it, then you would set it to zero. Spouses, you have the effect, the father and mother effect. All right, advances that is. All right, any questions about ASOC? ASOC can do all sorts of things. You need to read the uh, manual to see. As I mentioned, you can go ahead and go through a whole thousand or 10,000 uh, uh, and you can put in your marker that you want to associate with as a covariate. You can do things like you can have a maximum likelihood estimate, or you can have a wall test type test. Uh, you can do all these and uh, you can, for example, you may say, well, to start off with, I don't have covert values on everybody. Okay, if maybe it's a small proportion. So rather than lose that small proportion, I will just impute 
that value, just put in the average for that value. Okay, if the average of, of that value of the COVID over the whole sample, you can do that. And then you will get, you know, this will be wrong, but when you say you get the top thousand or so values with that assumption under the wall type test, which is very fast, you can then pick off, say, just the top, whatever, however many you want, and then make it maximum likelihood from then on and, 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 and only pick up those, that information that you know to be true. So you have a lot of uh, different options and you need to read the manual to see what they are and to realize that this was uh, meant to test for association before we had millions of markers, but you can adapt it to that by doing all these different tests, which may or may not be independent of each other. Uh, or, or you could make them independent of each other to start off with, as Joan has mentioned. Uh, but even so, you still get millions of tests. And I would recommend doing something far dirty, quick and dirty. First of all, and maybe you're doing 10 million tests. Well, just look at the top, I don't know, 50,000 first. Then those you will repeat doing a more accurate test, maximum likelihood, and only including the data that you actually have with no, uh, no mean uh, uh, imputing the, the unknown coefficients, the unknown variates uh, with their mean value. Well, let's talk about the haplotype estimation and analysis. That is where we were, right? Yes. All right. So, uh, I will just, uh, I don't click on anything. So we're going to talk about the likelihood for M SNPs. Can you see my, my uh, pointer or not? No? You can't see my pointer, right? No. Okay. So let HT denote the teeth haplotype from M SNPs and let FT denote its population frequency, which goes from one to T, which is going to be two to the nth power. So let H, uh, that's HT, given T lies between zero and capital T, be the set of all haplotypes. And then we let capital F be the set of all haplotype frequencies. And then we assume Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, random mating, and that all individuals are independent. So I just want to talk about the, e the EM algorithm problems. There are lots of problems with the EM algorithm. It's limited in the number of markers that can be considered simultaneously because the need to enumerate each possibility. The, with M markers, each with two alleles, you have two to the M haplotypes. And you can see from this table that when it was two, you have four haplotypes, five, you have 32. And you even for 10, you have a, over a thousand. It soon gets unwieldy. So the other problems with the EM algorithm, it depends on the starting point. So you have to implement multiple starts you end up with many haplotypes, each with a small probability. And it's not clear how to reconstruct the haplotypes themselves. Uh, the most likely haplotypes for an individual, or what we would like, DM algorithm does not perform well in the situation with rare haplotypes. Uh, we can do a likelihood ratio test if you have N groups, for example, case control status and HT haplotypes with frequency PIJ for haplotype I in group J. If you have that, then you can test the null hypothesis that the haplotype frequencies are the same versus at least one pair is different, okay, between the two groups. And the likelihood ratio criterion is then 
uh, it turns out you've got the likelihood for the end for the group and then for the whole sample divided by the whole sample minus twice the likelihood ratio asymptotically is a chi squared with n minus one times h t minus one degrees of freedom. Uh, is that about it? Is that the last slide, uh, Yunju? Yeah. Well, now, yes. yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I would recommend that you read the uh, manual. And I would recommend, I don't know who programmed this, but I do know that the whole idea was Katrina Goddard's. And after reading the manual, you might want to get in touch with Katrina. She might be able to give you more information. I don't know. So, uh, so this Daniel, Dan, Dan Beckley was the one who actually programmed. Who? Dan Beckley. Dan Beckley. Oh, well, we can still get in touch with him if we need. Yes, <laughs> I, yes I, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, typically, uh, he was not the best for writing up the, uh, the, 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 the what. For, for writing up what's in the manual though the manuals gives all these possibilities and you know i don't know uh, one of the things you can do is to form your haplotypes and you can make a decision as to where you a new one ends another one starts and i would suggest that that's the best way of doing it but you still either have to have multiple starts or there's what uh, Oh, somebody called the, what's it, the four point something? I can't remember what it's called. Uh, who, who's that person who did a lot of haplotype analysis? Uh, who did this? I, I can't remember, but it's in the manual. In the manual, there are other ways. And I think basically it's been used so little that we really have no idea what's the best thing to do. But I'm sure, Joan, you will try using it and by all means get some information about how it works. Okay. Yeah. yeah we're, we're looking forward to trying it and just, um, you know, seeing yeah. Yeah. what we can do with it in our families compared to some of the other haplotyping methods that sure. are not real... Uh, now, satisfactory. I, we'll see if this I, is any better. <laughs> I know, I know the default. I think the default yeah. is just to take 10, 10 random starts, but right. maybe you can change the number and see what happens. Yeah. But there is this four something rule. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's mentioned in the manual. Oh, um, rule? Say, what was it, Kenju? The four gamete rules? You're talking yeah, about? the four, four gamete rule. As I understand it, that's pretty good, but I don't know. Uh, and I forget who thought it up, but it's there referenced in the manual, I'm pretty for, sure, the four gamete rule. And as I understand it, you know, you could do that sequentially bit by bit. I think it might be much faster. I don't know. I really don't know. So uh, I don't know if you've got the last slide there, uh, you, which I'm um, any final questions. I'm very sorry for what's been happening. I seem to keep getting, and it's Google or something, Google Chrome or something keeps wanting to cut me off and collect some error data. So uh, I will look into this. But this is the last Zoom course I'm doing. So. <laughs> uh, if there's no questions, I would just like to thank you for attending this course. I thank you all and for bearing with me. I'm so upset that it's gone so badly. Well, but you know, yes. Robert, we've all are used to these kinds of problems <laughs> with Zoom and WebEx this last year and a half. Everybody just rolls with it. You just reconnect and go on. <laughs> wow, but it's been so terrible the way it says. This last time, by the way, I had to just uh, unplug my laptop completely. Don't ask me why. It, it said it was going to reconnect me, and then it didn't. So uh, 
Anyway, Yenju has given me some ideas I might work on, but I don't expect to be giving another Zoom course, so <laughs> I don't know whether I'll Who do knows? something. We about might be it. able to talk you into it. <laughs> oh my, that'll be the day. <laughs> you know what? I have so many uh, let courses slides that I have given at different places. And I, I went to some of the old ones to try and get stuff. But, you know, it's in, it's in a different font. It's a oh, yeah. different color, this, that, and the other. So I haven't really changed the slides very much. Uh, the one thing I note, uh, and I don't know why I made this error. You might notice when I said in the class A, you take the first four terms, you take only three terms. For some reason, when I was looking at this yesterday, I thought I counted four terms. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, I was so trying to get that, uh, you know, the other stuff going. The uh, right. it explained to you what how what we're doing is uh, in, in to get the uh, well to, to get uh, what I think is a reasonable prior for the uh, for the uh, uh, probabilities of uh, these alleles or these genotypes rather. Uh, so if you if you go back to the Elson Stewart paper, you'll see back at the right of the end of it, we were at that time only looking to find the largest. We weren't trying to find them all. I'll tell you something else. That is the section where there is one error in that paper. A what, very in Elson bad Stewart? Yes, there's a very bad error. Oh no! I, yes, <laughs> I, I, that day, those days, I was very naive in statistics, and I d talked about the uh, conditional probability when I meant the joint probability. Oh, so I let you all look for that and find it, but I know that I'll have to look for that. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that was written a long, long time ago. I've yes, learned a was. lot of statistics <laughs> since then. What, uh, what yeah. was the year? 1970. The, the, the Elston Stewart. Yeah. Was that 71 or 72? Yeah. So, so I, I was, think, yeah. I think it was 71 and the Hazen Elston 72. I was and just it, going to college and most of the people on this course weren't born yet. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're old, Robert. <laughs> and I'm especially old. So anyway, I really want to thank you all for bearing up with me. And I very, this will be when it, it gets onto uh, YouTube or wherever it's going, it'll be much shorter. That's good. <laughs> and, well, I, and I am definitely looking forward to having, um, to having this for my summer interns. Thank you guys for Good. doing this. Good. It's, it's Good. going to yeah. be very useful for them. Yeah. And I say, I want to thank you all, all you who are attending this. Uh, and I say, I have to thank the, uh, what is it, Emily, for uh, asking if we would do a Zoom course, which I stupidly said yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's very timely and, and it will be very useful for many people. Good. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. All right. So we're very early, I'm sure, but that won't matter. What I've got to look here to see the time. It's 4.16. Oh, well, it's only a quarter of an hour early, so it doesn't, it's not too bad, but this is your last chance. Oh, somebody wrote something in chat, which said they liked it. I think, I don't know what they, so let's, let me see what it says. This, this was a great, great, this was a great course and a great speaker. I learned a lot. I hope you can get him to do another one. <laughs> yes. Well, and, oh. and everybody on here, Robert has so many great lectures about so many things. You, oh you, you and I need to think about what else do we want him to record for us so we can use them for our students. <laughs> there yeah, are so well, many. Well, maybe I should send you all the... All the That's uh, right. All your I've got, all, of all, lectures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got them somewhere. 
I don't know. That's a great idea. That's well, a great idea. And, and yeah. you know, I've done them all over the place, all over the world. Quite I know a, you have. Quite a few in India. That was sort of fun. And yeah. for th those of you, if there, I don't know if there's any Indians present, but I did it during what they called a bunt, which means everything stops. They, they, they stop oh. the traffic. They stop everything. <laughs> oh, wow. But, but people still came to your class? Yeah, yeah. What they do, some, some, uh, they would, they'd either have to leave home like six o'clock to come to the university or they'd come late. And I think we'd start the course late. Ah, oh, okay. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. All anyway, right. but it's been fun. I've had a good life. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and from your student, me. And my students who have had your lessons passed on to them and their students who have had your lessons passed on to them, we all thank you, Robert. Well, I accept gratefully, but I'm not, <laughs> sure, I'm not sure I did that well this time. <laughs> okay. Yay. Still fun hearing from you and, and seeing these things over again. And uh, even though I... The, the things that weren't familiar, I don't pick up that fast, but it was still fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, okay. And the good, the good thing about Zoom courses is you can watch them a second time to get yeah. the piece you didn't quite understand the first time. And that is something I really like about these recorded classes. Sure. I, I think that's so necessary. You used to say, Joan, I don't know if you remember, you had to take the SAGE course three times to understand it. Uh, well, <laughs> always. And I tell my students this, that, you know, it's, you see it, you think you understand it, you do it, and you understand it a little better. You figure out the stuff you didn't really understand and you go back and try and learn it. And then when you have to teach it, that's when you really start to understand it. Right. Um, and I always found every, even though we, I helped do these SAGE courses, even though we did it over and over, each time there would be some new subtlety that I would go, oh, wait, I didn't really get that last time, even though this yeah. is the third time. So. Yeah. 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 And as I say, the best way to learn something is to teach it. Yes, it really <laughs> is so true. So yeah. true. All right. Well, it's okay. been fun, Robert. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it from Wayne State. Thank you for putting on this course oh, for us. Right, yeah, definitely. Wayne State guys, thank you for thinking of it and asking him to do it. Yeah, well, it's a wonderful program. We're so excited to use it in our research. So I'm sure we'll be in touch with questions once we're actually <laughs> inputting our data. So I <laughs> should try. You. I should try and answer any questions. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. And and yeah. Yunju, thank you for all of those practical tips. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs> okay. Bye then. This is the last call. I'm going to somehow, uh, I don't know, somebody's going to take my, I'm going to leave. You ready? <laughs> Here we go. Leave. Gone. Bye. 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 Bye.